Good morning. Today we're celebrating Palm Monday. We do it on Sunday, but it really occurred on Monday. Matthew shows Jesus to be the merciful and peaceful king of Israel. Storytelling is a fine art, and the best books often have endings that, that you don't see coming. They're surprise endings, but yet they all fit in with what happened up to a point. And then after you get into it, you, you have a hard time imagining to, that they could unfold in any other way. This is the, the, the essence of the plot twists of Charles Dickens and his novels. They usually come to a happy ending from a hopeless situation. Jesus is the Messiah, and he doesn't fit Jewish expectations. Jesus' peaceful way of being king is just one facet of how he lives out his countercultural kingship that gives up rather than trying to garner power. It yields power. Most people today have little first-hand knowledge of genuine monarchy. Those who hold the title of king or queen in modern societies have very little power or responsibility. It's an elaborate show. It means that they are a figurehead. It is full of splendor and pageantry. On May 6th, of this year, 2023, the Committee of Privy Counselors will arrange an event, the coronation of Charles and Camilla on Saturday the 6th at Westminster Abbey. They set the, the date to ensure that there was sufficient time to mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth II's passing. And also they have designed silk cloths, scarves, fine china, teacups and saucers, and all kinds of other paraphernalia. At the climax of events like this, the king would be presented with a scepter or would stand on a sacred stone or participate in some other ritual signifying the transfer of power and authority into his hands. Musicians would play, sing, and the crowds would break forth into spontaneous choruses of praise for their sovereign. See, every part of the ceremony is to designed to highlight the majesty, the glory, the power, and the dignity of the king. At the coronation in 1838, Queen Elizabeth Victoria, excuse me, of England wore a crown encrusted with giant rubies. 
and sapphires surrounding a 309 carat diamond, a crown with a 309 carat diamond on the top surrounded by rubies and sapphires. Her scepter was capped with a large diamond cut from the Star of Africa, weighing 516 and a half carats. See, it's a display of power and majesty and might. Accompanying them would be courtiers and foreign dignitaries with a large retinue of the finest soldiers. And many countries, high-ranking religious leaders would also participate. In Matthew 21, 1 through 11, it portrays the most significant coronation the world has ever seen. But it is marked in stark contrast to the kind that we have described already. It was a true coronation of a true king. He was affirmed king at his birth. And he was inaugurated into his, this kingship. But there was no pomp, no splendor, no nondescript sort of pageantry. Jesus' triumphal entry was his last major appearance before his crucifixion. He finally announced who he was. After healing two blind men in Jericho and leading Zacchaeus to himself, the Lord made his final journey up to Jerusalem. They were about to celebrate the Passover, which commemorated the Lord's miraculous deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. What better occasion could there have been for the Lord's anointed Messiah to make the ultimate and final deliverance of his people from tyranny? Today we're looking at Matthew 20, 29 through 21, 11. Jesus enters Jerusalem as the peaceful and humble king. He's the merciful healer and the peaceful king. And he claims to have received his kingship as the son of David and that he is fulfilling prophecies that have been made. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the road side, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and then told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. <clears throat> Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of the hymn and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The placement of these stories is obviously intentional. These men who are crying out for the son of David and find healing and sight, and then Zacchaeus, and this group moves up from the northwest up to Jerusalem. It's approximately 14 miles up. They left Galilee and went into the region of Judea on the other side of the Jordan. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The son of David children would re, would join in this chorus. Jesus had compassion on these two men, and he touched their eyes. They could see, and they followed him. They got up and they followed him, and they went to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Fourteen miles uphill later, they go to Bethpage, and at once you will find a donkey, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. See, Zechariah, and Zechariah 9, 9, points to this significance of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. This is a prophetic picture of Israel's king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and the foal of a donkey. See, this was a mode of transportation for kings in times of peace. We see this in 1 Kings 1, 33, 38 and in 1 Kings 20, verse 1. It's not the kind of approach that a peaceful monarch of the modern world would do. But this is culturally appropriate. This is prophetically in line with the expectations of the Jewish people in the first century. Others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. Hosanna to the son of David. See, this is the Galilean crowds were with him. And this is what they were talking about Jesus as being the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is from Psalms 118 verses 19 to 20. And this is all connected into his entrance into the city of Jerusalem. The book of Matthew starts at the very beginning by speaking of Christ 
Jesus as the Messiah, even in verse 1 1. And the narratives are all about that as well. Jesus said many times that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is revealed. Matthew 4 17, 5 3 through 10, 12 28. But this is the first time that Jesus publicly acknowledges his kingship. One of the prayers that were common with the Jewish community would be to pray to God, the king of the universe. And when circumstances in our lives are out of control, we can trust God. We can trust Jesus, that he is Lord and king over all. And this is Matthew's message, that Jesus is the Messiah King. He's initiating his own orient, uh, coronation as he enters the city. Jesus is no Xerxes one of the great kings of the ancient world was Xerxes of the Persian Empire. Esther, in the book with her name on it, along with her uncle Mordecai, were dealing with King Xerxes. And he was an authoritarian, power-controlling, king who controlled and commanded all the affairs of the kingdom. He's not like one of the modern monarchs who just sits pretty on a throne. What he said happened. He demonstrated his might by holding the power of life and death over every person in his empire. And at one point, he declares that all the Jews are to be put to death. Mordecai appeals to Esther, who is the queen, married to Xerxes, to intercede on behalf of her people. And her reply reminds him, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court <clears throat> without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they are to be put to death unless the king extends his gold scepter to them and spares their lives. Esther 4.11. See, Matthew shows Jesus' kingship is diametrically opposed it's not a display of power and despotism. It's one of humility and peace. And they're getting ready to celebrate the Passover, celebrating the deliverance of Israel from the Egyptian bondage centuries before. But the Master and his 12 disciples entered Jerusalem. Before they entered Jerusalem, they stopped in a little hamlet called Bethpage. They visited, it tells us in the Gospel of John, that they visited Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is after Lazarus had been raised from the dead. There was a, a great party that was celebrated be, to celebrate the re renewed life of Lazarus just before Passover. 
This is what they were celebrating. You know, Christ came and they had the stole, stone moved away from the entrance to the tomb. Three days later, they didn't want to roll the stone away, but Jesus told them to so that they could smell the stench of death. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out and his hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And then the next part of the passage, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And when the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. See, they were afraid that they were going to lose the temple and the nation. They do lose those things, but for a different reason. And then later on in John, it says, And when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up to the country to, from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before Passover. See, people would gather in Jerusalem and get become ceremonially cleaned before the Passover meal. They kept looking for Jesus, and they stood in the temple courts, and they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. As far as we know, there was no census taken on this year of the Passover, but we have census information 10 years later about the Passover and the number of sacrificial lambs that were slaughtered at the Passover was determined to be some 260,000 lambs. See, these lambs were raised in Bethlehem and brought into Jerusalem on a particular day, the 10th of Nisan the day called Palm Monday. And these lambs were each slaughtered. And one lamb could feed 10 people. Not always, but you know, it's, it's, it's a ballpark figure. So there could have been 2 million people in Jerusalem. It's not just the people of Israel. It's people from all around the world who are Jewish who come to Jerusalem for this gathering. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, we see in John chapter 12, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There was a dinner being given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with fragrance. But one of his disciples, Judas, was all upset. We could have sold that perfume and given money to the poor, Jesus said, leave her alone. It is intended 
It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This was a Sabbath celebration. After the Sabbath on Sunday, they met on the first day of the week and they celebrated before Passover. They came to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. See, this incited hope. The blind men who could not see, who can now see. The tax collector, Zacchaeus, who was stealing from the people. A super IRS agent. But he wasn't just taking it for himself. He was taking it for the government. The two were mixed together and people hated tax collectors. And then Jesus sends two disciples to procure the donkey and the foal of the donkey. So this great throng from Galilee, from Jericho, including the two blind men, maybe Zacchaeus, and others were coming up into Jerusalem. And this throng that had met in Bethany to celebrate the resurrection of Lazarus were all moving toward this gate. On Palm Monday, not on Sunday, they met in Bethany on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. The next day is the triumphal entry. It's the, what the Mosaic law required, that the sacrificial lambs for Passover were to be selected on the 10th day. This was the 10th day. The lambs came in, some 200,000 lambs, And they were, each lamb was given to a household until it was sacrificed on the 14th day. Jesus came into the household of Israel before he was to be sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan. It doesn't matter if he was crucified on 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. The 10th of Nisan was on Monday in both of those years. And he was crucified on Friday, the 14th of Nisan, as the true Passover Lamb of God. This prophecy, some 500 years earlier from Zechariah, that the Messiah would be hailed as their king and he was coming into the city and that he would be gentle and humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. He was a king like no other. His coronation was like no other. And most of the multitude spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them in the road, and the multitudes going before him and those who followed after him were crying out, saying, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
And Jesus began to ride into the city on Monday. They spread their garments. See, the, the Jewish leadership was looking for Jesus. They wanted to find him and arrest him. But he comes into the city with this throng of people shouting out his kingship, his messiahship, riding on a colt and the donkey together. They were saying by throwing their garments, we place ourselves at your feet, even to walk over if necessary. See, they had expectations that he would save them from Rome. They got caught up in that. but he was interested in saving their souls, not their nation. The people wanted a conquering Messiah who would come with great military power and throw off the power of Rome. But Jesus did not come to conquer Rome, but to conquer sin and death. He did not come to make war with Rome, but to make peace with God for men. In less than 40 years later, what the Jewish leadership feared occurred. That the temple and the nation would be destroyed. They were destroyed because they rejected the king of peace. In 70 AD, the Romans utterly destroyed the temple. It was so torn down. It was not until modern times, nearly 2,000 years later, that the ruins could even be identified. They were so buried and scattered. But this Jesus, who died as our Passover lamb, and we came back to life just as Lazarus did, but never to die again. He will be crowned one day in a way that is perfectly fitting. Every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Tells us that in Philippians 2, 10 through 11. And there is a great coronation in heaven that is described by John. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and a number of them was a, as myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every created thing, which is in heaven and on earth, 
and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. And I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessings and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. See, Matthew shows Jesus to be the true king of Israel, the son of David, who brings restoration. This is a picture of many worshiping and hoping for the coming Messiah. Some found him and believed. Some were discouraged and then they heard the gospel and, and turned and some went on to be destroyed by Rome in 70 AD. We each have a choice whether to worship and honor Jesus as the Messiah and true King or to worship something else, some other power or even ourselves. The biggest religion in the world is the worship of me, focusing on I am my own God. This is the emptiness that has led many to despair. We have no power, but the King Eternal, who sent his Son to die to deliver us, has power. He has power over death, and he can give us confidence and hope to face an uncertain future and to face the certainty of death with hope and optimism. He removes the sting of death and gives us assurance that we will be like him when we put our faith and our trust in him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we pray that those who have not yet bowed a knee to the King of Kings would bow. They would surrender their hearts to the heavenly power, to the ultimate King to the King of the universe who sent his Son to redeem the world and to restore the world through faith and hope and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.